So in your own career, you know, you develop all these ideas mm -hmm. about ethics, about doing the right mm -hmm. thing. I mean, in your case, like, where did it come from I mean, in terms of, like, how much of it was, you know, formal training when you heard how much of it was mentoring by the editors you worked under early on? I mean, where, you know, how do you well, develop I, this set of I guidelines think, or principles uh, for yourself? You know, I think uh, the guidelines and the ethics I developed were really developed primarily in my, in, 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 in my, in my childhood. I think my mom and dad and, and my grandparents, they were poor, but they were really honest people. Um, and, you know, um, my hero when I was a kid, uh, a young kid, um, was the Lone Ranger, Truth, Justice, and America, you know. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and he had his, you know, trusty Native American friend. Unfortunately, his name was Tonto, which in Spanish translates to dummy. Um, <laughs> yeah, Tonto. <laughs> And so, um, and so, uh, but I liked what he did, you know, he, he helped folks and, you know, and I, and I, even watching those shows and those values. And then my high school journalism teacher, Art Gallegos, was very good, um, you know, talked a lot about ethics. And then I had three great mentors, um, Eric Brazil, who I've already talked about, who picked me out of the El Charito market. Uh, and then I was about to quit, quit journalism, actually, after I got to the Sacramento Bee because I never could move up. Um, I was being, you know, kind of like pigeonholed. I felt like, you know, um, folks didn't, didn't, didn't respect me because I had come from the Fresno Bee to the Sacramento Bee and the whole terrible hierarchy that, that, that occurs within news organizations. I know. I feel lucky that you're even speaking to me. Somebody <laughs> who's at the Modesto Bee. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you start you start thinking. Uh, I was thinking about that, and I had this guy named Bill Endicott, who's uh, again I was, I'm supposed to have lunch with him on Friday. Um, but Bill was uh, the former political uh, uh, capital bureau chief of the Alameda Sacramento Bee, and he just took me under his wing. Um, I remember the day he called he, ca he called me in, and he said, uh, and I said, "Oh man, what did I do again?" He closed the door. And he says, why have they been keeping you on the sidelines covering this, you know, Penny Annie stuff? He goes, you're really good. He well, says, so what kind of, what were you covering? Politics. I was covering for Fresno and Modesto. And, um, and he says, you're really good. He says, you may be the best one, the best political writer in Sacramento. And he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I believe in you. And, you know, when you hear people believe in you and you look at their ethics and how they conduct themselves, and then Gregory Fav. Uh, the editor of the Sacramento Bee, senior vice president of McClatchy, uh, you know, he promoted me. I was I was essentially a recruiter. I was system managing editor, but I was essentially the recruiter. Did special projects for him. Edited special projects. It was kind of like the AME that was people knew because they thought he's never going to go anywhere. He's a Latino sitting in the corner. He's never going to go anywhere. So when the Emmy's job came open, nobody gave me a chance, and I don't. I didn't give myself much of a chance. Um, um, but, um, you know, I'd never run a budget, never supervised anybody, never done a review of anybody. I didn't have anybody reporting to me. And all of a sudden, out of a nationwide search, he chooses me to be managing editor. And I, you know, I still ask him, why did you choose me? He said, I, I knew you would have to grow. But he said, you had the ethical foundation that I was looking for. You were very principled, you know. You had, and you know, and I, and he said, I knew you wouldn't be the best managing editor I could hire at that moment. He said, I knew you would be in about two years, and so, and I, I, you know, he taught me a lot about, you know, the whole issues about race. I mean, this was a, he's a, he's a, uh, he's a distant cousin of Brett Fav, the, uh, you know, um, but uh, he says he doesn't know. How to, he pronounces his name Fav, Brett cousin Favre. Right. Yeah, he pronounces his name right. <laughs> And, uh, and he get, grew up in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, and, and Bill Endicott grew up in Kentucky, and, and Eric Brazil grew up on the other side of the tracks in Salinas. And, you know, why were these folks attracted to me? Why did they take me under, my, under their wing? And I think it's because we shared the same values, the same principles, the building blocks, you know. Um, we cared about people, we, you know. Um, we had passion for the business, and we were very had a lot of principles ingrained to us by our folks. And we talk about to each one of them; all of them had their real ethical values set in their young childhood, which is, I think, the same way that we, and then honed by the people you hung around. 
the one real follow up I wanted to ask about this is um, what did you do in terms of um, preventative measures after these fa serial fabrications were on? Yeah, we had uh, Bob Steele come in from the Pointer Institute. We had, uh, I did. Uh, uh, to do a series of, of stuff on ethics. We wrote uh, policies, uh, very explicit policies on and handed them out uh, um, to everybody who was on staff. Um, everybody I interviewed for a job from that point on, I s talked to them about fabrication, plagiarism, made them sign before they started something that said, you know, if we fabricate or we understand that fabrication um, or plagiarism is not part of, uh, you know, uh, the DNA at the Sacramento Bee and uh, anything like that, you know, can, could lead to up to including termination. So I took some really strong both reactive steps to go back. See, this is the kind of thing that was weird because I didn't think I had to explain that to people. It was, you know, I thought it should be part of the reporter or the editor's DNA. I thought this should have been ingrained in us through our careers or through journalism schools or, you know, from my own perspective, through your own childhood. I thought that's what you came to journalism about, was to be about, you know, try, try to tell the truth as close to it as you could get. Yeah, you know, when people ask me when I, when I was a reporter, yeah. were you ever tempted? I said, you know... In a way, the challenge of the job is to write a good story with what you have and right. no more. You know that it'd be like trying to like write a fourteen-line sonnet in fifteen lines. It's like no, that's like the challenge is to write it in fourteen lines. You know, it's like you know, I was never, I never tempted, but I, what I ended up doing is I always told myself I'm a good enough writer. I, if there's a hole, I'm going to write around it. Yeah. And so if I don't have it, I'm going to write around it. And so, you know, in a way, I was still lazy, but I wasn't dishonest and lazy. And so, um, you know, uh, I, but I just, I mean, just appalled me, you know, just a surprise. I was just surprised how many people didn't think. And then, then when I was before, before I was still editor, um, I had a, the, the dean of one of the, the journalism schools, a real prestigious journalism school in the country, called me and said, um, students these days don't see anything wrong with lifting stuff from the Internet without attribution. The remix, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and I'm saying, oh wow. I mean, you know, teaching ethics now is more important than ever because it's so easy in this internet age. You have so much information at your disposal. Um, you say, okay, I'm going to lift it. Nobody's going to ever find it. Interestingly enough, it's it's easier to find stuff too because you could run you can run all kinds of programs to look for pl plagiarism. Uh, uh, too, and so you know, students or journalists who are thinking they're being clever um, might end up wrecking their careers. Once you do something like that, you're pretty much blackballed. I mean, once you're fired for plagiarism or or, or fabrication, you're gone. Even you could be the one of the best writers in the country. You can be whatever. Time to go into fiction. You're not going to get back onto an organized journalism school. I'm not sure. Uh, on a journalism site. Now, I'm not sure though, is that going to change with the internet? Is that going to change with self-publication? Mm -hmm. um, do the standards change nowadays? And so it's a challenge that I think that we as educators now and the, and the current crop of editors and, and reporters and bloggers and people who are doing their own sites is a challenge that need, that discussion needs to be had.